I was sitting on the bima of the Barish sanctuary at a bar mitzvah service a few weeks ago, and I looked out into the congregation. I saw someone sitting about two-thirds of the way back who looked familiar to me, but I couldn't quite place her. As the service went on, it kept bugging me. Was she a congregant I didn't see often? Maybe a, another religious school parent who I pass in the hallways on Sunday mornings? She was too far away to get a really good look at her, but something was itching in the back of my brain, and then it hit me. We went to camp together in New Jersey when I was 17, more than 20 years ago. We were friends that summer, and we'd kept in touch a bit, but it had been about two decades since I'd seen her. We got to reconnect at the luncheon. It was wonderful. I share this with you because it raises a really important question about this week's Torah portion. Did Joseph's brothers really not recognize him? Years ago, they had sold Joseph into slavery. After more than 20 years have passed, Joseph has become the second in command in Egypt, and they have come there to throw themselves at his feet to beg for rations because there's a famine over the whole region. And the Torah says, though Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. If I can spot a camp friend and place her face from a few hundred feet away, could the sons of Jacob really not recognize their brother while kneeling at his feet? I know they didn't have Facebook to keep images of him in their mind, but still it strains credulity a bit. It's been bothering me all week. I was comforted to learn that it bothered the rabbis too. Midrash Bereshit Rabbah pins the whole mistaken identity thing on facial hair. When the brothers sold Joseph, he was a young man. He couldn't yet grow a beard. They were all older, so they already had them. In his time in slavery, in prison, and in Pharaoh's administration, apparently Joseph had started to cultivate a beard. This would explain why Joseph recognized his brothers, but they didn't recognize him. Alana Kirshen, an American-Israeli author and teacher, suggests that maybe this is the Midrash's way of telling us that Joseph has matured more than his brothers. But like, come on. <laughs> they didn't recognize him because now he has a beard? And the rabbis of the Midrash seem to acknowledge that they haven't fully solved the problem. They also look at a strange phrase when the brothers first introduce themselves to Joseph, they say, Kulanu b'nei ish echad, we are all of us the son of one man. The brothers didn't realize how right they were. All of them, including this Egyptian administrator they'd seemingly just met, were the sons of Jacob. In the Midrash, the brothers subconsciously recognized their brother, even if they didn't know it yet. It says that they had a spark of the divine spirit. Even before they knew it was their brother, a divine spark ignited in them that would eventually catch on. This is why I love Midrash. It's the rabbis having fun. They're playing with words and ideas. It's a sandbox in which elaborate rhetorical castles can be built up and then broken down to make way for other creations. I'll give you an example from the same Midrash. Maybe this divine spark of recognition came in part because the brothers were in Egypt not only to look for food, but also to hunt for Joseph. The Midrash takes us back to the beginning of the chapter when the brothers are still in the promised land. The text says, Vaya'ar Yaakov ki yesh shever b'mitzrayim. And Jacob saw that there were rations in Egypt. So he gathers his sons and he tells them, I've heard there are rations in Egypt, so go down there and procure some for us so that we can live and not die. Now, English is not like Hebrew. In English, a word might have two unrelated meanings, and there's no connection between, say, like, I saw with my eyes and I saw a piece of wood. But a Hebrew word can have a bunch of meanings, and for the rabbis, they are not unrelated, even if they might seem to be. For the rabbis, each word in the Torah is like a diamond, and each meaning of each word is like the face of that diamond, and when they shine a light into that word, it reflects, refracts out in a myriad of rainbows, all of them illuminating the Torah. The rabbis love to play between the seemingly unrelated meanings. 
It's where they build their sandbox. The word for rations that Jacob used is shever, but that word can also mean brokenness. There is food to be found in Egypt, but there is also brokenness. Jacob senses that in Egypt his sons will find the source of their family's brokenness that is only there that they can begin to repair. Vaya'ar Yaakov and Jacob saw, the Midrash imagines that Jacob had a vision of Joseph and that he sensed his son was still alive. Twenty-some years ago, the brothers had come to their father with Joseph's bloodstained coat. They told him an animal had attacked him. Maybe Jacob never fully believed them. Last week, we read that when he received the news, Jacob refused to be comforted. Rashi says that one does not accept comfort for someone who is really alive, but only reported to be dead. Jacob never gave up hope that he would see his son again. So when he has this vision of Joseph in Egypt, it renews his hope. The Midrash suggests that maybe we don't read it as shever with a, with a shin, but sever with a sin. Sever means hope. Go down to Egypt, Jacob says, and bring back my hope. Go down and find that boy who has been imprisoned there and bring him home. This is the mission that the brothers are on when they find themselves at Joseph's feet. They can't see it yet, but it's a mission they are one step closer to completing. The Midrash holds Shever up to the light and shows us the prismatic illuminations of rations, brokenness, hope. Now, why am I telling you all of this? Am I telling you this because I love Midrash and I want you to learn to play in the text of the Torah? Maybe. Am I telling you this because it's a story about going out to rescue a captive being held in a foreign land? That it's a story that reminds us never to give up hope on the possibility that a hostage might still be alive? Maybe. But more than all that, I'm telling you this because in Judaism, there's an intimate connection between brokenness and hope. Joseph's brothers have been avoiding their brokenness for 20 years, denying it, hiding it, lying about it. But Jacob sees what his, brothers, what his sons do not. Go to the brokenness, he says. That's where you'll find the hope. Jacob saw that there was shever in Egypt. The Midrash explains there was shever, brokenness in the famine. There was sever, hope in the plenty. There was Shever when Joseph was taken down to Egypt. There was Sever when Joseph became the ruler. There was Shever because Jacob's descendants would become slave. There was Sever that they would someday go free. Torah scholar Aviva Zornberg explains that the relationship of brokenness to hope in the Midrash is not merely sequential. Our lives do not only go from brokenness to hope, Rather, it is a dialectic, a constant moving from brokenness towards wholeness and back to brokenness all over again. In fact, she points out, you cannot have hope without some brokenness. When things fall apart, the opportunity for sever arises. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs teaches that the duality of Shever and Sever can be found in the Kabbalistic creation story of the Shivirat HaKilim, the breaking of vessels. God, in making the world, could not leave it void of God's presence. God, therefore, sent forth rays of light. The light was, however, too intense for the containers which broke, shattering fragments of light throughout the world. It's our job to gather these shards of light. This is the Kabbalistic understanding of tikkun olam, to be light gatherers, to pick up the pieces of all that brokenness in the world and to see in them divine light. It is in this gathering that brokenness becomes hope. This is the message of the Midrash, Jacob, in his vision, saw that in Egypt the brothers would find all of it, the rations, the brokenness, the hope. 
but they couldn't avoid it. They had to go to the brokenness. Maybe this is the spark of the divine that the brothers encountered when they first laid eyes on their long lost brother, their long estranged brother, their long tormented brother. There was a spiritual awareness that preceded an intellectual awareness that they were on their way towards reconciliation, the spark that rekindled the hope. Rabbi Nachman of Bratslav says, if you believe that it is possible to break, believe that it is possible to repair. This reminds me of the story of Rabbi Nachman's chair. Shortly before Rosh Hashanah in 1808, one of Rabbi Nachman's students presented him with an exquisitely handcrafted wooden chair. The, rabbis, uh, the rabbi asked his student how long it had taken him to carve the chair. The student replied that he had worked for an hour a day for six months. The rabbi smiled and said, then for half a year you have spent an hour each day thinking of me. The rabbi loved the chair and sat in, it, sat in it every day during his prayers. And when the rabbi died, his students kept the empty chair in the place of honor next to the ark, a memorial of their beloved teacher. And when the Cossacks attacked the Brest Lovers' town in Ukraine in the early 1920s, the students were not sure what to do. Surely the Cossacks would burn such a priceless Jewish relic. So it was decided that the chair would be dismantled and then cut into small pieces which were given to each of the Rebbe's followers. They dispersed to seek safety. It's said that through those pogroms, through even the Holocaust, anyone who had a shard of the Rebbe's chair survived. One by one, they made their way to Jerusalem. There, they reassembled the chair. Not a piece was missing. It can still be seen in the Breast Lover Synagogue in Mea Sharim, right next to the Ark. Without brokenness, there is no hope. When we choose to go towards the brokenness, when we do not look away, when we face what is hard and what is heartbreaking, there we find shards of the divine light. There we find the opportunity to rekindle hope in ourselves and others. Hanukkah has just come to an end, the holiday that is about bringing light to the darkest time of the year. We have finished the eighth night when there was so much light to remind us of miracles of generations past. But the end of the holiday does not mean the end of light or the end of hope. Tonight we have two candles. Tomorrow night at Havdalah, one. And from there it will be the light that you carry with you, the shards of the divine that you have collected and reunited. In these dark days, when you feel your grip on those shards slipping, when their light seems dim, go to the hard places. Go to the people who are hurting. Go to the brokenness. It is only there that we might once again rekindle the light. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>